The Sheena Bora murder case has been one of the most sensational crimes to have hit our headlines in recent years. Former media baron Indrani Mukherjee was charged with the murder of her own daughter alongside her then husband, Peter Mukherjee, who was also named a conspirator in the case. Indrani Mukherjee has argued that she is innocent and now after nearly seven years, the Supreme Court has granted Ms. Mukherjee bail. Indrani Mukherjee, emerging from custody, said she forgives everyone. Enabling her bail was young advocate Sana Raiz Khan, who after seven attempts, prior attempts by Ms. Mukherjee, came on to the case only 10 months ago and succeeded in enabling Ms. Mukherjee to walk out of custody, as I said, after nearly seven years. Now, as you can see on your screen, in their first ever conversation after Indrani Mukherjee was granted bail seventh time uh, after trying, are we going to hear in their own words what these seven years and of course the years prior have been about in this first conversation, as I said, after Ms. Mukherjee was granted bail. I do want to say upfront to our audience that because this is a sub judice case, Questions related to the actual case and the actual charges can only be answered by uh, Sana, who is, of course, Indrani's lawyer and the one who enabled this, uh, this interim relief for Ms. Mukherjee in court. And Indrani Mukherjee will be answering questions that directly relate to her and is not advised by her lawyers to answer questions on the case. So if you see the conversation unfolding in that way, this is the legal reason for it. That said, let's get started now with this conversation, something I know a lot of people in our audience, I guess, nationally, everybody would have an interest in. Indrani, let me start uh, by asking you, you know, looking, uh, looking at you, you seem comfortable, self-assured. Uh, one, if one didn't know, one would think you hadn't spent the last seven years in prison at all. Um, is there a sense of disorientation? Does this moment feel surreal to be to be outside, to be talking as normal as if, you know, nothing happened? Or is that, is that just how you've learned to deal with it? You know, Barkha, the first seven years, I mean, the last six and a half years, rather, it's, it was really, really tough. The first few months was by no means, you know, easy for me. But as time passed, I think I started adapting to my circumstances. Initially, you know, the whole incarceration had taken a toll on my physical health, my emotional well-being. But as time passed, like I said, I started, uh, you know, accepting that I have to spend some time in prison. And, uh, you know, I, of course, use my time very constructively. I will talk about it more as we, you know, go forward. Yeah, but once I came out, I think the first uh, three, four days, you know, has been uh, the time, you know, there is a change. It's a big change, right? And technology has moved forward. I've been sleeping on the floor, for example, the last six and a half years. So the first two nights, you know, when I slept on the bed, it's like felt strange. So these are little, little things, of course, you know, one has to like when I went in, the way it took time for me to adapt to my circumstances there, I suppose the same, you know, is going to happen here. But uh, that's what life is all about. And I am very, very positive now that uh, whatever I have, the amount of time that I've spent in prison and what I propose to do when I come out now, whatever I had decided, I would like to complete as much as possible. You know, you never know what, what's there in store, you know, for me later. So I, I'm, of course, confident that things are going to be positive and things will be, you know, in my favor. But whatever time I have left, so I am going to definitely, you know, work towards a lot of positive changes, you know, that I'd like to kind of, uh, you know, in a way help out the prison inmates or whatever, you know. So one of the comments that you made to the media and your brief interaction as you emerged from jail, you yeah. said, I forgive everyone. Who is this everyone that you're forgiving? You know, Barkha, once, you, once you've forgiven somebody, then I don't believe, you know, name shaming really works. Then really I haven't forgiven the person. So there are a lot of people who have hurt me, hurt me in the process uh, during this entire trial, I'd say, prior to that. But forget about what has happened before that. But after I was arrested, 
I went through, you know, a sense of, uh, I would say, I felt a sense of disappointment with people who were close to me where I didn't get support from. I went through a massive media trial, which was, you know, very, very painful for me. Without an, you know, when you're in judicial custody, you're not allowed to speak to the media, right? So I was never in a position to give my side of the story to anyone. So which was very, very painful. So, uh, you know, everybody decided that I was guilty. So anyway, so that was, uh, it took a toll, like I said, on my emotional well-being. And uh, you start kind of, you know, my confidence levels had plummeted, it had dropped. But over a period of time, again, I realized that, you know, people do what they have to do, but I have to kind of stay positive and, uh, you know, uh, face the challenges, you know, that life had thrown very unexpectedly at me. And yeah. uh, which is, uh, and I think the best way to move forward and to win over these challenges is to really forgive, forgive the people who have hurt you and uh, look at things more positively and, uh, you know, act constructively. I mean, even now our hands are tied because we can't talk to you directly about the case till the, there's a verdict and I'll direct my questions about the case uh, to Sana in a moment. But I do want to ask you, Indrani, uh, you know, there are people who listen to you talking about a media trial, talking about being betrayed by people, and they will say that you are looking for sympathy, you are glossing over the gravity of the charges. Nothing could be worse for a parent than to be accused of the murder of one's own child. And that is the gravity of the charge uh, against you. Do you really believe that you will be able to convince the court and the world at large that you haven't done that? You know, my priority right now is, Barkha, uh, to fight this case with the evidence that we have in our favor. And I know, I mean, I know I'm innocent. So I'm absolutely convinced, I'm absolutely convinced that truth and justice will triumph. And there is enough evidence which, you know, I can't talk about at this stage, right? But uh, this is not about, you know, sympathy or empathy. So I, I have no expectation on that front. At this point, to whatever, uh, you know, whatever uh, embargoes I have, I actually don't have a court embargo that I can't talk about my court case, but I wouldn't like to do it at this stage because my lawyers are there to speak about it to the media. Uh, however, I am, you know, definitely, I would definitely like people to understand over a period of time who I am as a person, what my compulsions have been, and you know, it is not just the lens that, you know, has been looked at me through. That is not who I am. That is not who I am. There is much more to it. There's much more to me. You know, probably I have never really had a reason to, you know, bring myself out to the forefront as a human being, as a person, right? So which is, that is an attempt I'm definitely going to make. Not, not necessarily because somebody has to empathize with me. But because I think, you know, it is necessary that people to whomever, whoever I wish to reach out to or whoever wishes to reach out to me, they ought to know who I am. And this is the best way I can do it. And I will, I will continue because I see it's not that I have lost faith in the media. Let me tell you. So it is certain sections of media I felt, you know, who were a bit, you know, harsh. But it's all right. I mean, everybody is entitled to their own opinions. And, uh, you know, I cannot grudge anyone on that. And everybody, that's what, you know, freedom of press is all about. Well, of course, the court uh, will have the final say on innocence yeah. and guilt and not the media. Um, right. But the media's job is, of course, to ask uh, tough questions. You have yeah. Uh, yeah. Been, been a media executive, uh, the owner of a television channel. So you know that that is our job as journalists. And let me direct some of those questions now to you, Sana. Uh, you have succeeded where uh, other lawyers were not 
able to uh, get that kind of result. You came onto this case 10 months ago. And in Ms. Mukherjee's seventh such application, you were able to convince the court that she should, uh, in fact, be granted bail. Uh, her former husband, uh, Peter Mukherjee, had been granted bail uh, much earlier. And that is something that the court, in fact, uh, commented on uh, while taking uh, the decision to also grant her bail. Let me though get to the nuts and bolts, uh, such as uh, uh, those can be discussed at this stage uh, of the case. One of the arguments that you have made as the defense lawyer is that there are major holes in the CBI's account, in particular of um, the key witness who used to be Ms. Mukherjee's uh, driver, uh, who testified and, and first revealed the fact of Sheena Bora's murder, who has since turned a prover and is now a witness for the prosecution. What is the core, Sana, of your defense for Indrani Mukherjee? See, the entire case hinges on the testimony of the driver who has turned approver in the case. He has confessed in, his, in this case that he, he, he for the possession of arms, for the reason he was arrested. And that led to the arrest of my client as well. Now he has confessed that crime in the CBI court, wherein the case is pending, where the trial court, where the case is pending, has denied the same charge in the Bandra Magistrate Court, where the Arms Act case is pending. So his subsequent denial to the said charge clearly establish, clearly establishes, clearly casts severe doubt on the entire case that has been built up against my client, on the entire case that has been concocted by the prosecution, because that casts severe doubt on the cred credibility of the main witness who is the driver in the said case. And he has subsequently denied the charge for the, because of which my client was arrested in the case. So that, so that contradiction, and apart from that, a lot of contradiction and inconsistencies have already come on record during the course of trial that clearly exonerates my client. So far, a lot of in discrepancies. Apart from that, you know, it is claimed by the CBI that the body of 2012 that was discovered by the Penn police station and the body that was exhumed by the Khar police station in 2015 are the same body and belongs to Sheena Bora. Whereas the prosecution, whereas during the course of trial, the prosecution has not been able to corroborate the same. The skull, that, one of the most pertinent facts about the case is that the skull, which was the skull of 2012 skull, which was... Uh, on, during the autopsy, the skull was cut open with a saw, and the same skull has been resurfaced as, a, as an intact skull during the stage of trial in 2019. So this case appears to be a case of growing skull. Apart from that, even the soil from where the body was, you know, uh, buried uh, in 2012 by the Penn Police Station, and the soil from where the uh, does not match the soil from where the body was exhumed by the Khar Police Station in 2015, and also DNA, which is one of the most important aspects. DNA pro no DNA profiling was done for the 2012 body uh, for, to establish the identity of the body. And to, so far as 2015, uh, DNA profiling for the 2015 body is concerned, maxillary teeth and left femur bone does not yield any interpretable data. And uh, so far as, as regards uh, the right femur bone and cervical vertebrae, it has been confirmed by the DNA expert during his deposition that he has altered the data in both, both the electropherograms to match the blood sample of okay, my client. Sana, so this is a clear tampering. Yes. Let me, let me jump in here. You're making a very technical argument. If I had to distill it into layperson's language for our audience, are you basically saying that the basis on which the body of Sheena Bora, Indrani Mukherjee's daughter, was identified is something that you believe is riddled with a lack of procedure and therefore you're not convinced that the body that was buried in 2012 is the same body that was exhumed in 2015. Am I summarizing your argument correctly? The evidence on record so far suggests the same, clearly indicates the same. That their, their allegation clearly is not being, has not been corroborated by the evidence so far that has come on record. If you see okay. the inconsistencies, yes, that clearly established okay. that the body is not the same, the skull is not the same. How okay, can a cut, I'm, how can a cut surf, cut skull resurface as an intact skull during? Because it has it, it has been reconfirmed by the deposition of medical experts, forensic reports. It's not just me; it's the evidence that speaks volumes. So it's the evidence. I'm that not, has come I, 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 I am I am not an investigator, and and therefore I can only ask the questions. But when I listen to you 
talking about skulls and exhumations and bodies, I think it's important to underline the seriousness of which uh, of what we're talking about here, the gravity of the crime, the fact that a mother has spent nearly seven years in jail on the charge of killing her daughter, uh, in a case in which her ex-husband has been accused of being a conspirator. And that takes me, Sana, to my next question to you before I go back to Indrani Mukherjee. And that is about the testimony of, um, of, of Rahul Mukherjee, uh, Peter Mukherjee's son from a previous marriage. I bring this up because the central uh, argument made by the CBI when they had to establish a motive that they could attribute to Indrani Mukherjee as well as Peter Mukherjee was that Miss Mukherjee did not approve of the relationship between her daughter, Sheena Bora, and, uh, and, and Rahul, the son of Peter Mukherjee. His testimony is in fact scheduled to come up later this week. How do you as Miss Mukherjee's defense lawyer plan to counter this formulation that this is the motive, this is the reason that Indrani Mukherjee killed her daughter according to the CBI? Uh, uh, yes, Rahul Mukherjee has not been produced in the court for deposition so far. Though it has been it has been claimed by the CBI that he'll be the next witness since last five years, list since last four years. So far as the motive is concerned, see our counter regarding this will be definitely at the final stage of the argument. Since the matter is subject is, I cannot comment you know uh, on his deposition. But yes, so far as the motive is concerned, motive and preparation does not by itself amount to crime or conspiracy. That is an established case law. So at this stage, it would be really premature to comment on uh, any any further aspect of that. Okay. Uh, we'll have to obviously save a lot of follow-up questions for a time when both of you can talk more freely. I'm still trying to ask as many questions as I can within these confines. And so, Indrani, my next question is to you. You know, uh, you've spoken about how you've not had a chance to tell your version of events, how you're not the way the world looks at you. But I'm sure even when your lawyer, Sana, was describing uh, what happened or what she says happened, talking in terms of skulls, bodies, exhumation, murder, this is your daughter we're talking about. And a large section of the world, a large section of the media is looking at you as a veritable monster who killed her own daughter. Have you got used to the way sections of the world look at you? How did how do you cope with that inside of you? Uh, you know, Barkha, initially it was really, really tough. Like I said, you know, I was... I was in shambles, okay, to start off with, I was in shambles. But over a period of time, you know, what I started doing, because I know I haven't done it. So I spent a lot of time during, in prison, I would say the last six and a half years. I studied my charge sheet over and over and over again. I read a lot of law books. I studied a lot of you know, other case, uh, similar kind of cases, a lot of case studies. And what I realized uh, that, you know, ultimately my innocence is only going to be proved in court. So I think over a period of time, emotionally, I started kind of conditioning myself to become more stronger and not get affected by what really the outside world has to say. Because at the end of the day, I think my biggest triumph is going to be the day I get acquitted. And I think that shall, you know, see, I am not uh, in prison. I've not been sent to prison because of the kind of, you know, there are a lot of kind of this thing. Oh, she's ambitious. She's this. She was against the relationship. She's whatever. You know, so I had, I had been arrested for a crime, for a heinous crime, like you said. For killing, I mean, it, it, nothing can be worse than, you know, the crime I have been accused of. Nothing. And that too of family. Here we are talking about somebody, you know, who's, I mean, you know, who's a part of myself, who's a part of my heart, who's my, you know, heart and soul. So we are talking about, you know, an accusation to that degree. Like you said, the gravity is, I mean, you know, there are no words to describe. Okay, so... The only way I think I could cope with it to work on the legal aspect of it as much as possible from my... See, at the end of the day, the lawyers need also, you know, your briefing. Because what a lawyer, whenever a lawyer comes to you, the lawyer, the first question the lawyer asks you is, have you done it or you haven't done it? Either way, your lawyer defends you. Hmm. Okay, but you need to do your own preparation because... 
you know nobody knows what happened what is you know what actually happened nobody knows better than me and i know i haven't done it so i know i'm going to win this i mean and but you the, know you know that anyone charged with a crime says they haven't done it so that won't be a line of defense that no, will go to court no absolutely not but i can't talk about that right now can i so even if tomorrow i decide you know i have in fact filed an application i i probably maybe cross examining some of my own witnesses myself so which you know i have the legal right to do that anybody can go and cross examine you know your witnesses so which i definitely intend to and uh, that is when i can answer a lot of questions which you know you i i'm sure you want to ask and i'm you know even i want to answer but i can't say that right now and my trial is in an open court and all the answers will come out in the open and uh, you know everybody will get to know the truth not just about the crime about you know the background to this whole thing so you know there is a lot of things you know which is kind of uh, i would say because the matter sub judice i can't talk right now but it is more again like i'm saying i am not reaching out today i'm not doing this interview because i want people to empathize with me the reason i want to reach out because there are a lot of things i have seen inside in prison which i hope you know during this period you know i hope you know i pray to god and i'm pretty convinced that i will get acquitted and you know i will stay out but you know you never yeah. know so and we we'll so, and we'll and we'll talk yeah. about your time in prison and what you saw uh, yeah. in in yeah. a moment from now but i have uh, i have one more question for you and then another for your lawyer sana yeah. and my question is that your other daughter vivi Uh, for yeah. whom this has obviously been an extremely traumatic uh, right. uh, period a period of anguish she wrote a book she presented her own version of events she's obviously very hurt obviously very angry uh, you're not if i'm uh, if i'm not uh, wrong you're not allowed uh, at the moment to meet with her um how do you describe the state of your relationship with your other daughter vidhi uh, indrani at this point see to start off with vidhi uh, you know to start off let me uh Uh, talk about the day i was arrested it was just vidhi was a day shy of turning 18 and we had great plans in fact uh, we had a big kind of get together for her friends just a day before that she was very excited and the next day we were supposed to do a dinner together you know with one of her close friends in uh, in bombay and so the four of us were supposed to go go out for dinner and uh, she uh, she was at school actually and when i was uh, arrested from uh, anand ashram which is uh, an orphanage where we had vidhi and myself had gone to plan uh, we had uh, planned to go the next day uh, to do some kind of charity work for her birthday you know, just some good work and uh, so when she came back off from school she saw this whole you know the living room full of cops and everybody turning you know the cops were turning the place upside down and peter study in a mess and all the computers pulled down and so when she came in and obviously she reacted she said you know what happened and till then i was not told i didn't even know there were cops and initially i thought i was being kidnapped actually so because they were all in plain clothes when they you know they just uh, you know bungled me into my car and that was it so i was brought home So when I came and I said what is it what's happened so obviously the cop said it's an accident so I still had no clue so when Vidhi walked in and she saw I said I said I don't know the cops uh, just brought me in here they said there's some kind of an accident and so she obviously uh, you know went in said you can't do this without a warrant and and that is when finally I think the cops connected with Peter and then they said that you know there's a Three zero two charge on Indrani Mukherjee. So obviously we were clueless. What's three zero two? So there's a murder. So that was the time. I mean, I saw that look on with his face. She was, you know, I would say, traumatized is an understatement. She was scared. She she don't know. It was like, you know, a thunderbolt had hit her. So she was rooted to the spot. and we were all kind of you know in a state of uh, you know complete uh, i mean we were disheveled we were shattered we didn't know what had hit us at that point so after that of course i was taken away and i just met vidhi uh, the first time i was produced in court and she was 
obviously in tears and she was hugging me and holding me mama said you know mama what's happened to all of us but after that i think as time passed i met vidhi once in the police station as well before she left for england see vidhi had uh, you know when i was arrested uh vidhi was not even 18 like i said so the teenage years you know from 12 uh, from 13 to 18 I think I had uh, kind of been the stricter parent in between Peter and myself. I was the stricter one. You know, there's always one parent who indulges and the other one who says, finish your homework and get your grades and do your piano lessons and, you know, those kind of things. So the memory that Vidhi had of me when I was arrested, arrested was that, the tough mom, you know, who just wanted things to be done the way it should be done. That was one part of it. post that i think till peter was still out i think she was still uh, you know she had a parent outside but after peter was arrested you know, she was an orphan and whatever information was being fed to her you know whether i i mean i can't really name because i i you know without evidence i can't talk but i know whatever has come to me as a feedback so she was dependent emotionally and financially also on a lot of people when both of us were inside and i think to maintain peace also she had to kind of i think uh, oh you know i'm just trying to find the right word uh but i think there were a lot of things that were fed to her a eh? and she had memories of me which were not necessarily you know of the lenient mom which would have developed over a period of time as she was blossoming into a, a you know lady and uh, the other thing i think on her own from her own point of understanding own point of view she started joining the dots herself and that is what really came out in the book her this is her understanding her perception of a 18 did you role. did you did you read the book yes no but before that's what i'm just coming to that so before uh, her book was published uh, she had done something which was i think uh, you know from a legal point of view i think she was advised to you know get kind of her own ducks in a row and you know uh, make sure that there are no legal kind of uh, issues later so she had actually sent the book uh, the uh, book to my lawyer before it was published well before it was published just to say in case you know check in case we had any objections and uh, of course i had read everything and my lawyers were of the opinion at that point <coughs> that you know the title ought to be changed and you know there's a lot of things that needed to be changed but i felt and that was the decision i took that i'm not going to make any changes and let her get it out of her system the way she wants to because that is something you know i you know for whatever it is you know i uh felt that she did not need to you forget about forget about me for a minute forget about peter for a minute and i know of senior journalists who had seen vidhi running around in knickers and in pigtails from the age of 3 and 4 i think you know some of them were brutal to her which was just so not necessary and it was just i mean it it was pathetic i would say it was pathetic why hit out i mean it, you know are you so starved of content that you need to hit out on a 18 year old child i would you know of course she was an adult let's say 18 but somebody you have seen running around in pigtails and knickers you needed to support her when i say you i don't mean you barkha you know the people who have been kind of printing or talking about malicious and felicious things about her which was just so so you know brutal so unkind and these are the people you know they should have supported her both her parents are inside and why target her for something she is not responsible for which was the reason i had told my lawyers i said let her print it out let her get it out of the system and at the right time in court you know i am going to give all the answers to all the questions that she had in the book also and as in as and when i mean right now i have an embargo 
on you know speaking with vidhi because she is one of the witnesses so but uh, what i propose to do is in my next court whenever you know i think my next court may be vacant i think so that's what my lawyer says but whenever you know the honorable judge presides i'm going to request him to call vidhi to depose because i know that vidhi needs me i know i know she needs me she needs a mother she's been trust me she's been an orphan for the last 6 and a half years and my heart really really goes out to her and i think she she doesn't deserve this and this is one of the reasons today you know i'll tell you something barkha why i wanted to talk to you you know when sana told me that you know you wanted to do this interview i said i needed to do this i know i can't talk to vidhi directly but you know this you know in this entire thing the most painful thing for me has been what vidhi has gone through i i think nothing has been more painful see this case is going to get sorted out eventually because i know i haven't done it i know the evidence is there which like sana already said i can't talk about it right now there's much more to come there are 185 witnesses left i don't know how long the case is going to take i hope it concludes early and i can you know uh, you know spend i can i can go back you know to england i i genuinely hope that but before i leave as and when some day i'm going to leave i know some day okay as and when like i said earlier there's a lot of work i need you know i'd like to do i've met with sections of people in prison which i'm going to talk to you about later which i i think there's so much work to be done and so much media can do you know instead of targeting 18 year olds yeah uh, let's do uh, return to the case for a moment yeah. with sana yeah. uh, and 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 sana i want to uh, you to respond uh, on the question of mr peter mukherjee uh, then husband of indrani since divorced uh, whether uh, you as indrani mukherjee's defense lawyer uh, see peter mukherjee as someone whose legal team you would coordinate with or do you believe that he has had it easier uh his family of course has argued that the only mistake he made was to blindly trust his wife then indrani uh how do you see his role in this entire case when you defend your client uh regarding peter's role it would be inappropriate on my part to comment because he is not my client so but yeah so far as my client's role is concerned i believe that my client is innocent and so the evidence so far also indicates that she, that exonerates her of the guilt so it at this stage i wouldn't comment on peter mukherjee's role and yes we are not coordinating with him as, as such there is no such uh, there is no no such thing going on but yes i it would be inappropriate to comment on peter mukherjee's role presently how will you counter as indrani's lawyer uh, the 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 sort of court of public opinion of course the court of public opinion should not matter the case should be decided any case should be decided mm-hmm. on evidence but as a lawyer sana i'm sure when you do strategy sessions with ms mukherjee you are aware of things that are in the public domain one of the things in public domain were tapes or uh, conversations uh, uh, you know leaked uh, which suggested that rahul mr mukherjee's uh, son was constantly and this is his charge uh, pushing uh, his father and indrani on the disappearance of uh, sheena bora indrani's daughter and making the point that you know there was no response forthcoming they didn't seem to want to find it and so on we've all heard those tapes how are you going to counter the impression of guilt and innocence that these tapes uh, that were called the, the the sort of you know indrani mukherjee tapes have created that could of course influence the judge as well the uh, when you spoke about the media trial yes the media trial can, can hamper a case to a large extent there is no doubt about that uh, there is no doubt about it and the authentic authenticity of the tapes will be established at the stage of trial so presently what i will say is that you know there are dfsl certified messages that have been retrieved from rahul mukherjee's phone that clearly show intimate messages that have been exchanged between sheena and rahul in the month of september that is 5 months after the alleged death of sheena bora alleged murder of sheena bora so if you know if you see the cbi evidence only that has come that this is the evidence that has been produced by the cbi this is dfsl certified messages so if you see the evidence that has been produced by the cbi so far these messages this i mean how will how can it be justified 
You're so, saying that you're saying that the evidence suggests that Sheena Bora was alive long after the date that she is said to have been murdered on. Yes, the evidence suggests that she was in touch and she was in contact with Rahul in the month of September. That is five months after the alleged murder of Sheena Bora. And these are DFSL certified messages that have been retrieved from Rahul's phone. I want to ask you, uh, Ms. Mukherjee said that she cannot take this on directly, but as her lawyer, you will have to tackle this question in court. And you've made a very, very sensational uh, uh, sort of argument right now. You've said that Sheena Bora was alive well after the date on which uh, it is alleged that she was murdered by her uh, by her own mother, uh, uh, among others who were involved in that conspiracy. Uh, one of the points at some stage that was made in the proceedings was that Ms. Bora is still alive. Is that a line of argument that you as uh, Ms. Mukherjee's lawyer are sticking to? Or was that loose talk by one of the inmates in prison, uh, Sana? See, the, that was intimated to my client by an inmate from the Baikala jail. And my client has rightfully written to the head of the CBI. So she followed the legal procedure. She has written to the CBI director. And thereafter, you know, there was, she, we, we, man, we were, even I thereafter, I also subsequently wrote a letter to the CBI director. And we managed to follow up for quite a long time. Since there was no response, we had to approach the court. And we have moved an application in the court, uh, which raising the same contention, because my client wants to know the truth. So now here, the question is not whether she's alive or not. We want to know the truth. It is for the court. CBI to investigate and we have rightfully moved an application in the court which is pending and the court will certainly decide on it because you know my client wants to know wants to verify wants to verify the authenticity of the information that my client has received from an inmate and rightfully she needs to know the fact so it is but you are making the argument that Ms. Bora was alive longer than after the date. Yes, this is not my claim. This is not my client's claim. This is a, this is an information which my client has received from an inmate in the jail. So this is not no, our claim. Aside of, aside of that, you have made the argument that for five months later, based on text messages exchanged between Rahul and yes, her... This, you, that, that is, again, that's not my claim. That is the evidence. That is the CVI evidence that, that clearly suggests the messages that clearly established that they were in touch because these are messages which I'm talking about, which are, which are a part of the chat sheet. These are DFSL certified messages that were exchanged between Rahul and Sheena in the month of September. To be very specific, okay. 26th, 27th September 2012. That is five months after the alleged murder of Sheena Bora. So I'm talking about the evidence here. And the evidence clearly, it is the evidence that actually decides the nature of the verdict ultimately of any case. Uh I have one more question for you. And again, I'm sure uh, Indrani feels odd because she's right here in this conversation and I can neither ask her this question directly nor can she answer it. But as a lawyer, I know you speak for her. In that book that we were talking about, written by, by Vidhi, that Indrani said her lawyers wanted to stop, but she said, let my daughter get all of this out of, uh, out of her system. One of the allegations that she made was that her mother hid from her that Sheena was uh, her sister. How are you going to counter this in court? Because you see, all of these things create an impression um, of, of, of subterfuge, of something being hidden. So as a lawyer, how will you address this in court, Sana? I believe my client is not an accused in this case because she was the mother or the sister of Sheena Bora. She's, ac she's accused in this case for an alleged murder crime. And honestly, the evidence so far, clearly, as I've already stated, the discrepancies and the inconsistencies have been favoring her so far with the evidence that has come on record. For the evidence that is yet to come on record and for the further evidence, we, will, we shall certainly make our final argument and that uh, will happen only at the final stage of the argument. Yes, and you know, rest of the things are inconsequential. When the when the evidence that has come on record so far are so substantially favoring us, so I think rest of the things are really inconsequential, and you know, these materials will not uh, will hardly matter. Will hardly matter because it is the evidence, as I've already stated, that ultimately decides the verdict of every case. Uh, Indrani, let me take this back to you. How has prison, how have these seven years changed you? You know, you gave us small glimpses about, you know, I, I, you got so used to sleeping on the floor that coming back out and sleeping on a bed again uh, is, is a peculiar feeling. But that is perhaps uh, every prisoner who's reasonably well off who goes in and comes out. But fundamentally, you know, um, it, how has it altered you if it has? Are you the same person you were when you went in? Uh, like I said, when I first went into Baikula, it was a shock to my system. 
Okay, so I, I'm going to take a little bit of time on this because there's so much to talk about. But anyway, I'll, I'll make it as brief as possible. So in the first, in fact, in the first uh, 15 days, I think 20 days after my arrest, I lost my mom. And a few months later, I lost my father. And the, uh, I'm not talking about so much the um, creature comforts. Let's start off with even the creature comforts. Why not? Of course, you know, coming from, you know, having a bed to sleep on and sleeping on the floor, just, just, just the basic, this thing, you know, it kind of hits you that where am I? What's, what's happened? But what I realized, you know, over a period of time, uh, the, before, before that, let me talk about the emotional side of it. So after I went into prison, of course, I was not allowed to watch uh, any of the news and uh, also the newspaper cuttings because, you know, I think the prison authorities were trying to be, uh, uh, you know, mindful about the fact that I shouldn't kind of get emotionally so stressed out that I kind of end up doing something silly. Yeah, so that was one part of it. But what I used to really wait for, you know, the first uh, couple of months, you know, everybody's mulakats, we used to have this family mulakat once a week. So everybody used to come for everybody's families would show up. So I'd obviously wait for my name every day. And uh, Vidhi had left by then. And my lawyers would come uh, very regularly. And then for some reason or the other, nobody came. And I was obviously waiting for Peter to come, right? So, I mean, he was the only family that I had here. So, and then, of course, there was no sign of Peter. And what I realized, you know, that uh, most of the women who go into prison for the same crime, for the same crime, if it's a woman, 90% of the women are abandoned by their families, by their in-laws, by their own families, you know, by their parents, by their brothers, sisters. Whereas, you know, Baikula has a gents section also. So 90% of the mulakats actually are for gents. And for the same crime, the family, friends, everybody supportive, uh, you know, uh, of uh, the male member of the family, if you're a co-accused. So in fact, initially when I had, uh, went in there, I had no checkbook, I had no money, I had no clothes. You know, and there was nobody who actually came to give me any of it till, you know, my lawyers started kind of saying, hey, listen, you know, you need to kind of move court to get your checkbooks. You need to kind of pull yourself together to get your own life sorted out. You know, you just don't worry about who's there, who's not there. So being abandoned in prison, you know, for women, it's, it's, it's I think, uh, it's one of the saddest, saddest, uh, I would say, you know, situations to be in. And it's, it's not just, it didn't just happen to me, I've, like I've said, it's 90% of the women. That's one. The second thing I realized is that not everybody who goes to prison is guilty. I think 75%, 75% to that extent. And I'm not saying this because, you know, people come and say that they're innocent. I have seen in front of my eyes people who have been in prison for eight years, six years, 10 years, they have been acquitted at the end of the day. After spending all those years, I've seen people, you know, who've been there, whose actual, you know, the punishment is for five years and they've spent eight years. So it's because of the lack of, uh, you know, family support. And now, of course, there's a stronger legal aid system there, you know, post the pandemic, I must admit. But, uh, you know, people, women just go there and get stuck. That's the second thing. And... Uh, I believe, this is again my view, that unlike in, uh, you know, uh, when it's a male accused, you know, the family does everything to clear out the media perception if it's a media case. At least, you know, however angry you are, whatever it is, at least to the outside world, they put up a, you know, united front. But in case of women, it doesn't happen. Whether it's a small crime or a big crime, it's when the gravity of the crime is irrelevant. So I think that is another thing I've noticed. You know, I remember reading an Indian Express um, article about you. You yeah. you've mentioned that you waited for Peter Mukherjee to come and meet you when he was not yet in custody and he never came. Yeah. And you, you make yeah. the larger point about women inside prison being abandoned. Yeah. 
And this article actually was after uh, Peter was also arrested, Idrani, and it spoke about how people would come and meet Peter, but nobody would come and meet you. Yes. Do you, yes. Do you remember that phase? I, as I was well? just coming to that. I was just coming to that, and it's just not. Uh, you know, it would go to the extent of. You know, nobody, of course, because a lot of people were told not to speak to me. That's a different that I'll come later. I know I, I shouldn't be sounding, you know, like I said, I've forgiven and it's all because people have actually discreetly even it's very, very strange. You know, people have discreetly, a lot of people have communicated with me in prison and a lot of people from quarters that I had not expected, you know, had extended their support to me. So some of the people who had actually written to me or communicated with me, some through my lawyers had said they've been actually told, you know, not to communicate with me and not not by legal advisors, you know. So uh, and uh, there were situations where, you know, I'd been caught and uh, see for whatever it is. I mean, I, I don't, you know, like I said, I don't hold grudges, you know, and uh, it's just all in the past. And, you know, I, I choose to move on and. Uh, uh, but there have been times I was actually sitting in court and, you know, if my lawyers were busy, I'd get hungry and, uh, you know, there'd be food for Peter. Nobody even offered me a biscuit, you know. I mean, that's, uh, you're talking about being, you know, you forget about the crime for a minute. I've been his wife and I've been a part of that family for years, you know, for 16 years. So that's like, it's not a small amount of time. How would you describe your relationship with him? today. You know, both of you got divorced while, and I know you can't speak extensively about the divorce at this point, but I was I just can, making I the can point. Speak. Of course I can speak, but I okay. will speak about that at a later time. But yeah, sure. sorry. I, no, no, I was just making the point that you were both in custody uh, when that divorce actually went through. How would you describe, uh, you know, because your lawyer said that, look, for her, you are the client. She doesn't really have any interest yeah. or engagement with his case. She's not coordinating with him. But you were married to him for, I think, what, 17 years? Am I, am I right? Was yeah, it 17 yeah, years? Yeah, yeah. 17 yeah, yeah. years. How would you describe your relationship with him today? His family may not have been friendly with you, may not have offered you that biscuit. But today, at this moment, now that you're both out, how do you see that relationship? See, at this point, I'll tell you something. It's not just now, even earlier. I'd say uh, we've tried to maintain a very cordial relationship and I am going to, irrespective of whatever has happened, and which is what probably was actually very painful for me, because I had tried to imagine at that point that what if, you know, instead of me, Peter was arrested, what would I have done? Would I have actually uh, stood up and said, hey, listen, you know, what are you talking about? This is not, you know, this is not the man I sleep with you know, every night and I spend, you know, every day with and he's innocent. What what are you talking about? You know, that that would have been my reaction, right? Irrespective of. So that was, I think, a very painful moment for me because I felt at that point it's not so much Peter's family. See, we are talking about a murder. He, he, this is not something, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, that, you know, it's it's not a secret affair I had and, you know, Peter didn't know about it. It's, we are talking about a murder I was accused for, accused of. And the least my, you know, my expectation at that point was that he should have supported me in every single way, in every single way. This is what I felt at that point, okay, at that point. And I would have done so. I would have done so. If Peter was the one who would have got arrested. But over a period of time, I mean, this is what I feel. Okay, when I used to meet Peter at court and uh, I had spoken to him on several, uh, you know, VC meetings we used to have, you, you're allowed to talk to your spouse. I think Peter did regret, I think, having not really reached out to me. This is what I felt. This is what I felt. Okay. And probably not trying to hear my side of the story. He did regret. And, uh, you know, the reason I filed for the divorce was not so much, you know, I, I just feel that after what we have both gone through, I think it is better as two independent people, I think we can have a better relationship. 
because we still have Vidhi in between us. Yeah, and and uh, no, right now I am not in contact with Peter for various other reasons. You're aware I can't talk about those cases, but I am a witness against him in a couple of cases. So it's because of that I am not in contact with him. But uh, if there is anything required, which is, you know, connected to Vidhi or which is, we would definitely communicate with court's permission. We would definitely do it. But yeah, so, I think, you know, we all have our regrets, but I would mention and I will be there for him whenever I mean, irrespective of whatever has happened tomorrow. If Peter needs me, yes, I will be there for him. Even today? Anytime. Of course, even of today. course, of course. Of course. So, and even so for his family, point. actually, you know, I'll tell you something, Barkha. I'd said this when I came out. You know, I was very, very upset. You know, because I knew I was innocent, right? And the least I expected was, you know, people, you know, my own family needed to hear my side of the story instead, instead of shutting me out of their lives. That's what I felt initially. But I am there even today for the people. You know, I may not be, you know, when I walked in, I'll tell you something, uh, Barkha, I had a I had a small family. But when I went into prison, I haven't, those are the people, you know, whether it was my lawyers, whether prisoners, whether the cops, some of the cops inside prison, I would say, or some of the, you know, people who reached out to me, even people who were barred from speaking to me and who were advised not to speak to me. Uh, you know, those are the people who have wiped my tears or held my hand, you know, when I needed their support and believed in me. And uh, I have actually come out of prison with a much larger family. So, you know, if you, you know, who's my family today? I have a much, much larger family. And they may not be my blood relatives, but I would, I know that they'd, you know, do anything for me and I would do the same for them. And as far as the people you know, who did not stand by me, I, I know what it feels like. You know, when you need someone and that person is not there for you. And no, nobody can understand this better than me. So I'm definitely going to be there even for those people who have actually, I feel, who have let me down. Hmm. You know, so, so obviously, obviously yeah. the Peter relationship to that extent is not a dead, frozen, cold relationship. Oh, no, it's no, still... no, 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 absolutely not. Okay. Uh, I want to go back to another member uh, of your family, but I will take yeah. that question to your lawyer. Uh, yeah. And Sana, of course, I'm talking about uh, the allegations that came uh, from Indrani's son uh, from, uh, from a previous uh, a marriage, Ashina's brother, Mikhail, uh, who gave statements to the press saying uh, that he believed that his mother, Indrani, wanted to harm him, kill him as well. Later, the defense was able to, in this particular case, uh, release conversations or proof of conversations between him and the driver who was the key witness that the prosecution was citing. Talk a little bit about uh, the, the claims that were made by Mikhail, Indrani's son, and how you plan to counter them. See, firstly, in all his media interviews after Indrani Mukherjee's arrest, he has clearly stated that he did not feel at any point in time threatened by my client. He's, he stated that uh, in many of his interviews, it was much later that this whole you know, angle cropped up by the CBI it was like after 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 quite a long time. And furthermore, during the cross examination, also he has admitted that he had a loving and affectionate relationship with my client till 2014. Uh, so regarding the numerous calls the, that have been exchanged between him and Shamvara, uh, that could establish a nexus. But at this stage, I would say that you know, it, I would state that further elaboration on this aspect will can ol will only take place during the time of final argument. As a lawyer, the onus is also on you to create an alternative narrative about your client in court. You know, you've made some points which are clinical, technical points. Uh, but there is there is the larger uh, sort of, you know, we saw this, for example, play out in the Nupur Talwar, Arushi Talwar murder. Narrative uh, and perception became a key part of the public discourse and therefore a key part of, of even the legal discourse. How do you, Sana, intend on... Uh, on, on, on doing this. Is it your aim to create reasonable doubt uh, about motive, about technical procedures? Or is it that you're going to argue in court that somebody else actually killed Sheena Boy? See, it would be too premature to comment about, about our future course of argument and our final argument at this stage. Uh, but yes, in the court of law, I'm again reiterating, and it's a fact that in the court of law, evidence is what determines the nature of final verdict. So in this case, the evidence so far has been 
favoring us and the evidence has been substanti substantially favoring my client and that exonerates my client to a large extent all the discrepancies and incons inconsistency that have come on record are certainly favoring us and for the evidence that is yet yet to come on record and for the further evidence we will certainly decide and elaborate about a final argument at the stage of final argument so again i'm i cannot comment on that at this stage let me give uh, you, uh, Indrani Mukherjee, the last uh, word in this conversation. I'm sure there'll be more conversations where we'll be able to get into some of the specifics that we've not been able to address today. You know, we read in the press that one of the inmates in prison uh, actually died. And you started, in fact, uh, uh, the newspaper called it a mini mutiny. You started advocating for better rights for prisoners and so on. Do you find your life transformed from that moment of being a media baron to now being this kind of activist in custody? And when you said that you today have a community that is not your blood relatives, but is, you know, who do you mean? Do you mean the inmates and the people you met inside prison? Who do you mean? Who has in fact stood with you? You know, like I said, there were, of course, uh, the inmates, definitely. And uh, there are people from outside, like I said, who were barred to, who were advised and barred to speak to me even. They have been supportive. And my lawyers, of course, one is sitting here right now. And, you know, I really owe it to her, honestly, you know, the freedom that I'm, you know, getting right now, what that I've got right now. And she had promised me, in fact, 10 months ago when I had appointed her, you know, Sana had come to me to meet me in prison. And she looked at me, she said, you know, I'd go, I've gone through all your evidence and, uh, you know, I'm going to get you out. No matter what happens, I'm going to get you out. You just have to have faith in me. And I saw that, you know, indomitable spirit in Sana. It was not just belief, you know, she just, I mean, she was so determined. She said that I'm going to get you out and I am going to come to collect you. I'm going to come to collect you myself and you're going to be free. And you're not, you're not just going to get acquitted. We don't have to wait till the end of the trial. I'm going to get you out now. So my first reaction, in fact, you know, when I had stepped out and I saw Sana standing there and smiling, my first reaction was, you know, I said this 28-year-old had promised me and we did it, you know, and she kept her word. And uh, so, I mean, for somebody, you know, like Sana, she's defended me. I know I'm aware of it that even in these last 10 months, she's been defending me, you know, wherever she's been spoken to me, not just as a lawyer, because she believes in me. As a human being, she believes in me. And uh, there are people, you know, who we have also barred from going out and talking because I was inside. And it was very important that, uh, you know, there should not be an impression that, you know, you should hear it from the horse's mouth. That's the thing. One is when I'm saying horse's mouth, whatever personally I've gone through, I didn't want somebody else to come and talk about it to the media. I waited for six and a half years to talk about it myself. I could have done it. My lawyers could have spoken. My friends could have spoken. People who I you know, believe are my friends, whether they're inmates, whether they are you know, people who have discreetly been, been in touch with me, or I could have uh, you know, used someone else you know, I had to write a book and give my side of the story. That would have been the easiest thing to do. I could have, you know, caught hold of a 20-year-old and I could have done it. But I didn't do it because I don't feel that is the right approach. This is my view. Okay, this is my mm -hmm. view. And, and despite, you know, Barkha, again, I must uh, also reiterate this. You know, I was initially very uh, pained by what certain sections of the media you know, had to kind of say about me. And also on the personal front, there was more of like, she's very ambitious. And, uh, that's all right. You know, see, everybody's entitled to their own opinions. Everybody. I mean, you were, you, were, you were in effect in the media called a yeah, social yeah, climber. Yeah, yeah. You were accused yeah, yeah. of using yeah, relationships even... to move up. Uh, you see, know, it wasn't just the that were painful. Uh, that's how you were spoken of. You know, I, unlike, unlike a certain journalists like you, and today that is one of the reasons, you know, I gave my interview to you today. Because, you know, it is absolutely, see, I am not inside because of, you know, I, I was not arrested because of the color of my hair. I was not inside because of, you know, uh, you know, what color bindi I wear, you know. So th those are the things I just found, you know, whether I was social, that is a personal aspect of my life. But, you know, very few people really stuck to the facts or, the, or their understanding of the facts, okay. 
but again having said that it's free media has the right to talk about everything even if it means shredding the person to pieces that's all right that's freedom of press whether it's me whether it's anybody but you know i only feel this is when somebody is talking about a legal case you know i think enough research need to be needs to be done because at the end of the day you know the perception the media you know what is that is put out by the media to a large extent i think unless like you have clinching evidence in your favor which is now in our case that is beginning to happen okay so which is why i am kind of much more relaxed now but i think it does uh, cause prejudice it could cause cause prejudice to you know i think even to prosecution for that matter forget about the <laughs> accused and definitely the accused definitely the accused and uh, you know i i think uh, you know i mean we have a robust media here and in really capable journalists i think the indian media that way is so kind of capable of bringing about so much of change you know so so much of change and really work on even i'm talking about the legal cases okay even let's just stick to even if we are sticking to my case as long as there are facts it's all right i mean you know now when i've come out after that i've been just going through you know a lot of these interviews just to understand that i'm talking about the television interviews so just to understand and i i've been actually shocked at the you know malicious and the fallacious i would say debates or the these things that have gone out you know which has you know got no truth no element of truth in it that's my point you know and opinions well, are well, fine opinions yeah. are absolutely fine uh, i i i do want to ask you you've spoken about writing a book you said the book won't be about yeah. the case uh, you have a plan for 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 the time that you you spend out you're obviously sana is going to hope that you don't have to go back uh, in again um what would you say in the end will be your priority now and how has prison life and this entire experience being called a murderer being called uh, being looked at as a monstrous sort of mother who killed her daughter how has that altered your sense of self is there something you would have done earlier in your life that you would just not do now because of this experience okay i'll answer you've asked me uh, actually three questions here so i'll answer yeah. your first question that's regarding my book uh, actually initially i had no plans really to write a book it was in the last two years during the lockdown i really didn't step out of prison right even the prison was sealed so that's the time i think i was kind of quite done with le- you know reading all the legal books and my you know the different case studies my chart sheet so that's when i started writing and i can't really tell you what the book is about and uh, it's of course not connected to the jail right now as of now so i am writing two books one after the other and at the appropriate time i will let you know what it is all about the first book is almost completed i've just got a couple of i'm at the tail end of the book and uh, i've got a couple of chapters left so i think with a bit of luck i think in the next 5 6 months it should be you know all happening so that's on the book front now the second question uh, you asked me was uh, you know how what's the most that... important lesson yeah what's yeah, the most yeah. important no, lesson uh, uh, no you're talking about uh, first let me talk about uh, how it has transformed me as a person you know i have uh, lived in prison with people who come from all different backgrounds all different backgrounds and uh, in fact this is very interesting because uh, when i went into prison and i found it really really funny yesterday i watched this movie because everybody said you must watch this movie gango by katiwadi i watched it and i found it so funny because there was one line she said you know um, the protagonist when the journalist introduces himself that i'm a journalist so she says me prostitute and i literally had this experience when i almost it was like deja vu when i walked in you know so there was this lady who was there uh, i think she was a mobile phone you know thief and they call them i can't remember what's the term they use for that so uh, she introduced she said you tv 
she said me mobile phone th- chore she really she actually said that she's me me mobile phone chore so you know i've met people who come from human trafficking some innocent a lot of them innocent people who have come from ndps people who have come you know from uh, accused of murder like i would say 75% of them are innocent abandoned there and there is a natural sense of uh, you know empathy and bonding which i felt with a lot of people there people from the slums a lot of people from the slums i've also come across people there who because of the free medical facilities who when they get pregnant you know they go and steal a mobile phone to go into prison so that they can actually you know deliver the baby in the government hospital so i'm talking about you know i've met with people people from different walks of life and which was a big eye opener for me i would have never come across these people at all and whatever i would you know i can do i can do whether you know as long as i'm in india and i hope that you know i am able from here to be able to as and when my case is over you know i can leave and i can come back freely as and when the case is over but i'd really like to you know do something for these people who are genuinely habitual criminals so that they don't really because you know what happens they get bailed they go out or they get punished but they then what happens after that they go back and do the same thing because there is you know there's nobody for them waiting there they are on the roads there's no way to kind of introduce them to an alternative life who's going to hire them who's going to give them a job who's going to kind of show them the right you know direction so there is uh, no future for them so they continue and i've seen that people who are not criminals who have actually gone in and in, gone in as innocent you know they've just uh, somewhere somebody was standing there they actually come back and say they say that ab to karke aaunge it's like that so i think we need to put in a lot of thought into those kind of things you know then of course that's one also i think uh, you know the prison infrastructure within their own capacity whatever they can i think the prison authorities provide i think there's a lot of lot of funding that requires to be given to the prisons lot of funding there's so much to be done there and i think people need to be made aware the prisoners need to be also made aware of their own human rights on this human rights thing i must i suddenly remembered you know there was a very interesting tweet that came to uh, sana uh, just day before yesterday from the international human rights commission and which said that uh, you know that uh, congratulating and there was you know my uh, photo below and my bail article below that i think it had come from geneva most probably and saying that uh, you know we are so happy that you did not give up and you proved at the end of the day that you know bail is the rule and jail is an exception so i think you know one has to needs to do something about these languishing under trial under trials mm-hmm. for years on end and then they get acquitted so uh, yeah I, I, the transformation overall is that i'd like to do as much as i can for all these people as long as i'm outside and as long as i'm in the country i'd like to you know do whatever possible so that these people don't go back and commit the same crime and you know come out and commit the same crime and do whatever i, I, I can yeah i do i i, I do have to close but I, I, anything you you would have done in an earlier life that you would not do today it could be personal professional lots of things yeah <laughs> so we need another we need another interview yes. or follow up yes. interview for that uh, when we yes. can also ask you many more specific questions both to you and sana uh, thank yes. you this is indrani mukherjee's uh, first uh, interview uh, in depth interview after uh, getting bail that bail order coming after nearly 7 years enabled by young advocate asana rais khan who as we just heard it promised miss mukherjee that she would get her out and she has but of course this is going to be a long haul uh, process um you know it's going to take maybe even a few more years before guilt and innocence can be uh, conclusively established because that's just the pace at which our legal system works but as they say watch this space hopefully both uh, sana rais khan and indrani mukherjee uh, in a short period of time will be able to take on more uh, specific questions than they've been able to 
uh, do today. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Ms. Mukherjee and to Ms. Khan for your time. And we'll be sure to follow up with you and to see how this case uh, unfolds and progresses further. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Baka. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent, robust journalists.